Good evening and good day, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Ask Abhijit Show, episode 133. And as usual, we shall discuss matters of great import in this episode, all thanks to the questions that you ask. And before we get into that, let us take a look at who all is with us today, tonight. Um, I can see Akshat, Sangeet, Lover, Ishan, Vaibhav, ABR, R242, Avnish, Rishabh, Pankaj, Rishikesh, Sarthak, Pranjal, Harshit, Kunal, Unknown, Sudesh, Mohit, Shreya, Shashank, Goblet Fire, Alpha, Ashai, Guest User, Crazy Brain, VK Tiwari, Pratham, Agarwal, Rohit, Himanshu, KP, Piyush, User 007, Ojas, Sayan, Abhay, Rahul, Utkarsh, Divesh, Don't Hide From Me, Aman, Rishi, Shubhangi, Vist, Vladimir, Adityanath, Durga, VLK, Arnab, Pearl, Karan, Sarthak, Bhargavi, Abhinav, Gaur, Sandeep, Shahin, Astra, Samarth, Chiching, Ajinkya, Azminor, and lots of other people. Good evening, good day to all of you. Thank you so much for being with me on this latest episode of the Ask Abhijit Show. So, um, I think we know what we're going to discuss today. I think you can all guess what uh, the topics are going to be like. So, without further ado, let's get into the questions. What is question number one for today? What's the question? Suspense. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, Saurav says, with the passing away of Queen Elizabeth II, I uh, wanted to know if she was equally responsible for the horrors of colonialism imposed on India and various African and Caribbean nations since she was born in 1926, much later after the British occupation of India. Right, a pertinent question. Was Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of Britain and UK and all that, was she responsible for the horrors of colonialism? So uh, we can look at it in a variety of ways. Let's take a look at her lineage, her family, yes. Uh, her great-great-grandmother was Queen Victoria, who uh, who reigned up to 1901. I think her, her rule begins in 1837 or something like that, yes. And uh, she ruled over India via the first of all the, uh, the British East India Company and secondly by direct rule for for much of the 19th century and during this time millions of indians were deliberately starved to death in a procession of artificially induced famines year after year after year right millions tens of millions of indians overall if you look at the overall uh, period of british occupation of india more than 100 million indians were killed in artificial famines a significant portion of that happened under during the rule of of uh, queen victoria and victoria it's under it's during her rule that the first war of independence 1857 happened and in the after, in the aftermath of that at least 10 million indians were, were killed in reprisals by the british yeah so this all happened under the watch of queen victoria queen victoria was also responsible for the uh, drug running that she did i mean if you think of the greatest drug smugglers and drug runners in the world you think of someone like Pablo Escobar, right? Well, Pablo Escobar was small fry compared to Victoria. Yeah. And 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 uh, she essentially used India as a as a base for producing opium and various drugs, which she would then sell to China in exchange for gold and various treasures that would be plundered out of China. <clears throat> the century of humiliation that the Chinese always talk about, right? After Victoria, you had other other uh, monarchs essentially. Uh, so if you look at Elizabeth, her father was George the Sixth, who ruled from 1936 to 1952. I think he died in 1952. He presided over the Bengal famine, which was the last great artificially induced famine that the British bestowed upon India. I would say between four to ten million Indians, mostly Bengalis, were needlessly and deliberately killed during this time. Yeah, he was also responsible for the partition of India. And the genocide that ensued, yes, one sided genocide that ensued, yes. So you could say that Elizabeth is not responsible for this. It's only her family, her ancestors that are responsible for, responsible for all of these things. You could say that, you could, you could make the argument, yeah. Now, if you look at various uh, pictures of Queen Elizabeth, hmm, the second, 
you see there is crown jewels she is very proudly wearing yes where did these crown jewels come from these are all stolen and plundered from various colonies including india mostly india where does all the wealth come from the british monarchs were middling monarchs they were not great monarchs until they acquired india india was the jewel in the british crown all of the wealth all of the prosperity all of the magnificence and glory comes from wealth plundered from india and elizabeth may not have done it personally but she certainly enjoyed the fruits and the benefits of that and she proudly displayed the stolen jewels and she still did, she did that all her life and her descendants will also do that one day right so this family is is responsible for incredible plunder incredible amounts of misery genocide of 100 maybe a, more than 100 billion indians yeah plunder slavery you can whatever you can imagine they have done it all she bears the legacy she bore the legacy of this and she wore it proudly yes what else so all the wealth was stolen and plundered that's how the uk became prosperous and rich now let's look at the career of elizabeth the second yeah you could argue that all of this is was bestowed upon her by fate by her family and she just uh, took on the responsibility and carried it forward let's take a look at her career so elizabeth uh, became queen in 1952 while she was on a trip to kenya they say that she went up a tree princess and she came down the tree uh, queen that sort of thing because she learned that her her daddy had passed away in uh, in in the uk so as soon as she became queen there was this rebellion in kenya that took off the mau mau rebellion which uh, lasted about 8 9 years 1952 to about 1960 or so at this time winston churchill was the prime minister of the uk he was her prime minister and he unleashed horrors upon the people of kenya horrific warfare millions of bombs were dropped on on kenyan civilians horrific abuses happened the kind of torture i cannot even utter over here that's what was done routinely upon the kenyan people under the supervision of queen elizabeth ii more than a million innocent kenyan civilians men women and children were placed in concentration camps in horrific conditions under the supervision and benevolent gaze of queen elizabeth ii and mr winston churchill yes so this happened while she was queen she was no different from her predecessors and her ancestors then you had the suez crisis 1956 in which uh, the the british invaded an independent nation egypt along with france and israel now israel had some actual reasons for doing it but what business did britain have invading a sovereign nation egypt yeah that's a whole different story i'm not going into the story the causes and all that but uh, and the americans had warned the british not to go not to go and do this but they did this anyway and this was the end of british supremacy in the world 1956 marks the passing of the baton the transfer of power from from london to washington right so she under her under her supervision under her directions britain tried to invade egypt yeah so the imperialism is very much there there was no difference in policy now let's talk about the 1971 bangladesh liberation war people don't really really know about the role that britain played, played in this we know that the uss enterprise was sent by president nixon yeah task force 71 it was sent sent into the indian ocean the bay of bengal to intimidate india apparently now most people don't know that the british also sent a carrier battle group an aircraft carrier carrier battle group the hms eagle and its accompanying warships to accompany the uss enterprise and that task force in order to intimidate and bully india yes this was all done under the direct supervision of elizabeth ii so there you go the same mentality the same approach imperialism bullying other nations same thing and in africa colonialism then let's talk about ireland the irish occupation the british occupation of ireland yeah uh ireland northern ireland essentially is still under british occupation it is it is british occupied northern ireland it is and and the people of ireland don't want british rule even today yeah 
and the kind of atrocities the British perpetrated in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, Ireland, especially during Elizabeth's time, w- w- are kind of suppressed. You know, you don't know about these things. For instance, the 1972 Bloody Sunday Massacre, in which 26 unarmed civilians were massacred in Northern Ireland in the town of Derry. That's just one example of the brutality and oppression that the British perpetrated on their Irish neighbors and are still doing. And this all happened during Queen Elizabeth II's rule. Then there is the Malvinas War, the Falklands War in 1982, in which there was this unprovoked aggression. I mean, you could call it provoked or whatever. What business does Britain have occupying islands off the coast of Argentina in in South America? close to the South Pole. What business does Britain have doing that? And yet they went there with, the, um, with their navy and the, the Argentines tried to uh, take over the islands and the British beat them off. This all, this is again imperialism and colonialism all under Elizabeth II. And then you, you have the consistent support that the UK has given to Pakistan throughout Elizabeth's rule. And the UK, all the newspapers, all the institutions, all the policies, the foreign policy, etc., have been consistently anti-India. Yes. So that is the legacy of Elizabeth II. She was no different from her predecessors and her, her, her ancestors and her family. She was just the same. No different. Yeah. What And what about her legacy for, for the UK? I mean, let's even talk about that, yeah? I mean, uh, so she, she I, I think during her rule, there were 15 prime ministers in the UK. The last great prime minister, so to say, of the UK was Margaret Thatcher, who uh, was prime minister from 1978, 79, I think, 79, until 1990, yeah? Then there was a transition period in which you had John Major, who was Prime Minister in the late 1990s until the late 1990s, 96, 97, 97, I think. Then Tony Blair. Now, Tony Blair is universally regarded, and I this is this is not my words. Yeah, I'm just quoting. He is universally regarded as a American, as an American lapdog, as an American poodle. So it is with the coming of Tony Blair to power or, or the installation of Tony Blair as Prime Minister that the UK became a proper vassal state of the US. This happened during Elizabeth's tenure. And then after T- Tony Blair was, was Prime Minister for a decade or so, he was very close to the Americans. And after uh, his time was up, you had a procession of prime ministers. Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris, Boris Johnson. And now you have a the latest one, whoever, whatever her name is, Liz Truss, right? She's been around for six or seven days as prime minister. A whole process and procession of prime ministers after Tony Blair. You can see the Japan playbook being unleashed on the UK. Yes, Japan also, apart from one great man, Shinzo Abe, they had a procession of prime ministers who did nothing, who no one rem- remembers. The same thing is now happening in the UK. One mediocrity after another. So that, that is the legacy of Elizabeth. She presided over the crumbling of the British Empire. Until 1956, Britain was still uh, a world power. After the uh, Suez misadventure, they ceased to be a world power. They became a second-rate power. Today, they are a third-rate power. So Elizabeth, no matter how much you eulogize her to to the high heavens, she presided, she took over the the crown. She, She was crowned the queen when Britain was still maybe number one, number two, or number three in the world in terms of great powers. It was still, it still had that great prestige. And today, it's not a second-rate power, it's a third-rate power. It's former colony, the, the India has surpassed it in terms of, uh, of annual GDP, and it's just the beginning. So this is the legacy of Elizabeth II. She was no different from her uh, from her ancestors and her predecessors. She had the same colonialist objectives and mindset, the same imperial behavior, nothing different, right? So, yeah. So if you were to ask whether she was responsible for the horrors of colonialism imposed upon India, well, she came after that. But she continued the same policies in other places. She tried her best to, uh, to continue all that. Didn't work. Because there was a new power on the horizon, the bigger daddy. So that's what happened. Question number two. Okay, this is a very popular question. 
Swaroop says, the government of India has decided that there will be one day of state mourning in, on September 11th throughout India in the wake of the de de demise of Elizabeth II. I don't think she's worth mourning even for one second as neither she nor the royal family has given an official apology to India for their barbaric, barbaric doings. Your thoughts on this? Edwin Snowden says, I thought we were going on the right track with the Navy enzyme in renaming of Rajpath. But now India has announced state mourning for the death of Queen Elizabeth. Is there any explanation for this move that you can see? Imperior says the Indian government declared one day of state mourning on September 11 and so on. On the other hand, the state, same government talks about removing the colonial mindset and erasing the colonial legacy. Isn't that hypocritical? So this is just three questions. I've got like, I don't know, 30, 50, 100 questions like this. Yeah, so this the, these three questions represent all of you who have asked the, uh, similar questions. So. What's the deal? Yes, India did declare one day of state mourning, official mourning, September 11, uh, and the flags will fly at half mast and all that. What is the need for that? What is the reason for this? Yes, we, the, the Prime Minister on 15th of August in his speech, in his address to the nation, did say that we need to eradicate all vestiges and traces of colonialism in India by, uh, by 100 years of independence, 2047. Yes, and we have made the right moves. We have... Uh, removed the St. George's Cross from the naval ensign and we have replaced that with something indigenous. Excellent move. And we have re renamed Rajpath to uh, Kartavya Mark Karm. I, I'm not sure. Please forgive me because I don't remember what it is. But we have renamed it. We have given it an indigenous name. Again, excellent. And the place where the statue of the British king used to stand, now we have the statue of Netaji standing there. So we are making the right moves. Now, why did we do this? Why did we declare a day of uh, mourning for Elizabeth II? Well, it's just, you know, it's words. Yeah, it doesn't make India colonized in any way. It, it, it still, I mean, kind of reminds you of the vestiges of colonialism. So the Prime Minister has said that we need to remove all traces of colonialism from India by 2047. It's a process. It's a step-by-step -step process. We are not there yet. Yeah, Right now, India is a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. What is the Commonwealth of Nations? It is the Losers Club. It is a club of losers, the nations that were ruled by the UK. Yeah. The Americans were also ruled by the UK, but they have chosen not to be part of the Commonwealth. India, because of historical reasons, because of the great, magnificent Shri Nehruji and his successors decided to... So because of those uh, leaders, leaders, India is a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. And today, for the time being, maybe it may be something to some extent beneficial. It may serve some purpose to be in the Commonwealth for now. Yeah, since we have been in the Commonwealth since 1947 or whatever, whenever the Commonwealth was formed, uh, right now we are in that. And uh, just to be polite, we have done this. So this is simply a, a symbolic move. It may have some geopolitical purpose. See, geopolitics is not a black and white thing. It's it's uh, complicated. So we may not know exactly what the, what the deal is. The thing is, it doesn't make any difference, right? The prime minister and the government may declare one day of mourning. It's up to you whether you want to mourn or not. I'm not mourning anything. I'm not mourning her demise. Are you mourning her demise? No, you're not. That's it. End of story. Right? So uh, there are certain symbolic gestures that the government does for foreign policy reasons, for diplomatic reasons, etc. It's just a gesture that we all can ignore. What we are doing Overall, see, these are words, words versus actions. Our actions, if you look at the diplomacy we are carrying out with the UK, it's quite robust. We are also eclipsing them. We have already eclipsed them uh, uh, from the perspective of the economy and so on. So we are going ahead of them and there is no stopping us. So all these small things, right now, India is still not a major, I mean, as major a power as we would want to be soon enough. Yeah. So right now, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, Bide our time. Hide your capabilities and bide your time. That, that's what Deng Xiaoping said. We are still in that phase. Patience. Patience, my friends. We will be there. And soon enough, sooner rather than later, we are going to exit the Commonwealth. Right? It's going to happen. So have a little bit of patience. A little bit of patience, I mean 20 years. 10 to 20 years. Soon enough, it will happen. See, the, these things, they take time. All right? But we are on the right track. So this state mourning and all, it doesn't make us colonized anymore. It's just a, a token a gesture of respect or whatever you want to call it. It means nothing. It is for us to decide whether we want to mourn her or not. And I don't think 
I, I know some people in India may be like enamored with the British royal family and oh, R.I.P. the Queen and blah blah blah. But most of us aren't, right? So that's what matters. So I am not concerned about the day of mourning. It doesn't make any difference to me. And I kind of understand why these symbolic messages and gestures are sent out, which mean nothing actually. S. Nayak says, please enlighten on why the UK has a monarchy, the so-called queens and prince and king, now they have a king, and democracy also. Hmm. Is this any geopolitical strategy or any hypocrisy on democracy? <laughs> you know, this is very interesting. This is a very good question by S. Nayak. Think about it. The British have a, a royal family. They have a monarchy. The king or the queen, whoever it is, is the official head of state. They don't have a constitution. Yes. And they have a parliament, uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons and so on and so forth. And the head of state is the king. Earlier the queen, now the king. The British have never abolished their monarchy. However, the puppet regime they put in place in India, there was a transfer of power from the foreign occupiers to their chosen minions in 1947. That's what happened in 1947. It was not independence. It was uh, dominion status and then India became a republic a couple of years later or whatever. Right? That's how it is. So 1947 was a transfer of power from the British to the people they had selected. It was selection, not election. There was no democracy involved in this. And when the transfer of power happened, the people who they had selected, Shri Nehruji and etc, 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 they abolished the Indian monarchies. So the British had already destroyed the real ro royalty of India, the real uh, kings and queens of India in 1857. Any single king or queen or royal family that opposed the British in 18 1857 was annihilated. And then they placed puppets in their place. So the royal families supposedly continued, but these are fake royal families. The real kings and queens were killed off, annihilated. And then their far-off relatives or whatever, their, their traitor relatives were put in place. And in some cases, some royal families decided to cooperate because they had no option. That way they would perhaps serve their people in some way at least. So some royal families cooperated and some were annihilated and replaced by puppets. That's what happened in 1857 onwards. So these are the various uh, princely states. Some of them actually were good people. Think about the royal family of Travancore. They did not allow the British to know about the incredibly enormous treasure which is in the Sri Anantapadmanabha Swami temple. More than a trillion dollars worth in today's money. Had the British known that and come to know about it, they would have plundered it, obviously, right? So some royal families actually did, uh, did serve the nation in whatever way they could. But most were destroyed. These princely states, which existed in 1947, were all well uh, disenfranchised, and the the the, the princely states were abolished. The royal uh, uh, thing was ended, right? And they were given privy purses, and later on, even that was ended. So India was made to abolish its monarchical system that had been continuing since the since the Vedic age, yes. But the British are still continuing with their monarchy. What incredible hypocrisy this is. Think about it. Think about it. India was made to abolish its monarchical system, which had been in place since the Vedic days, maybe the pre-Vedic days, thousands of years, maybe 10,000 plus years, abolished in, 18, in 1947. The British are continuing it. Yeah? But they are a democracy. They are a first-class democracy. And we are supposedly uh, what some some lower form of democracy according to the so-called democracy rankings and all that. This is the incredible hypocrisy, and we went along with that. I am not saying this system is good or that system is good or whatever, right? But we had a system that has been continuing for more than ten thousand years, and it was abolished by these British-appointed minions in eighteen in nineteen forty-seven. So, uh, what can I say about the fact that the UK still has a monarchy? Well, they do what they want. They continue their system and they, 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 they are proud of it. We, on the other hand, we, we are self-loathing people. We think that everything that is Indian is bad. Yeah, That's the problem. Right? That, that's what the Prime Minister spoke about when he spoke about colonialism. We are still mentally colonized. We still feel that we are inferior to everybody else. This is... 
the problem. Please, please wake up, my friends. Anyhow, next question. Khusro Anushirwan says, what are your expectations from Kim, King Charles III? Richa says, um, could you please talk about the importance of the British Queen in the current world scenario and the, how is the new British King's influence going to be different or not so different? Okay, let's talk about uh, Shri King Charles III. So Charles has been the king in waiting for God knows how long. Since I was a little toddler, he was the king in waiting, Prince Charles. Yes, he was like waiting. When will I be king? When will I be king? And now at the ripe old age of 73, when he can hardly stand straight, he has become king. <laughs> what are, are my expectations from King Charles III? He has inherited nothing. Okay, I'm sure he's very wealthy. Yeah, the British royal family, I'm sure, has incredible uh, resources and reserves of wealth plundered out from mostly India and various other places. I'm sure they are very wealthy. I'm sure they are very, very well connected, very powerful. But the UK, which they rule, is now a third-rate global power. It's not even a second-rate global power. It's a complete lapdog of the US, a poodle. It's a vassal state. That's what it is. It's totally controlled by the United States. Yeah. So what has he inherited? He has inherited a vassal state. That's what he has inherited. And he is so old, he can't even change anything. At the age of 73, I'm, I don't think you have the kind of energy you had at the age of 43. Yeah. Kings ideally should be young. Young, vigorous, energetic, ambitious. Charles, I'm sure, must have been ambitious when he was younger. But what ambition will he have at the age of 73? So I expect... I may be wrong. I, I don't wish anybody anything bad. I expect Charles to hang around another 20 or so years like his mother did. His mother passed away at the ripe old age of 94, I think. So if Charles lives another 20 years, he'll be 93, maybe longer if he is uh, if he is lucky. So now his son, William, will be the king in waiting another 20, I don't know how many years. He's what, 30 something now. So he'll be in his 50s when he eventually takes over, if everything goes well. and. Their, their relevance isn't much now. Yeah, so uh, in the current world scenario, they don't have any real importance. Uh, various colonized and formerly colonized nations still revere them to some extent, yeah, because of the education system and the mental colonization. But apart from, so th what they do is they have these periodic tours to African nations, etc. Nowadays, they're not so welcome to India anymore. So they typically go to African nations and the Caribbean nations and all that. And they, they show how great they are and people worship them and people salute them. People come out in large numbers to see them and you know that sort of thing. Apart from that, there is no actual geopolitical or, or international significance of this royal family. Yeah, it's a, it's a vestige of an older age and they are not really relevant anymore. The custom may continue for some time, for a few more generations, perhaps, perhaps not. We have no idea, but that's how it is. So uh, their influence is mostly zero. Yeah, they have no influence anymore because they no longer are in power. They no, no longer control the nation. They are just figureheads. They may be very wealthy for sure, but wealth doesn't buy you power. If you have watched my Chinggis Khan video, you will know this. Power can buy you wealth, but wealth cannot buy you power. So that, that's where they are. Next, the question. Okay, Siddesh so says, what do you think, what do you think of the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss? And how important is the UK to India? RL says, writing to you from London, as India dumps the UK behind in GDP, who will benefit more from a free trade agreement between the UK and India? UK being a major exporter of services can gain a lot more from India, access to 1.3 billion plus people, than India can gain from accessing the small and declining UK economy. How do we make sure these looters don't try it again with India? Okay, okay, two questions, but uh, re related questions. What do I think of the new British Prime Minister Liz Truss? She's a nobody. She's gonna, she's gonna achieve nothing. Yeah, she was one of two candidates, you know, who contending, vying with each other to ascend to the post of Prime Minister, which is the servant in chief of the of the U.S. Empire. That's all it is. Yeah. She's gonna achieve nothing. She's going to last maybe two or three years. And if she lasts too long, they shall be replaced by some other prime minister. That's how the, the typically works in the UK now. Yeah. Two, three years, the prime minister lasts and then something happens. You know, something is engineered. 
political coup or whatever and then a new prime minister comes to place and that new prime minister is again person, a person with no great leadership capabilities or anything no great vision their only vision is to serve the masters so that's what i think of liz truss she's a nobody and she won't achieve as far as i i think she's she's not going to amount to anything like her predecessors before her her more immediate predecessors before her now uh, the other question is about a free trade agreement you know the uk is still the number 6 economy in the world the only relevance they have today the uk in the global economy as the is as the global hub of money laundering all the various companies shell companies you know dodgy companies shady companies etc that exist in the world for the purpose of money laundering they are all headquartered in london many of them not all many of them and there's all whole kind of all kinds of fishy dealings happening in london and all the various uh, dictators have significant investments in the uk and in london they own uh, properties in the uk and london various indian fugitives i don't know for some reason they like to go to london and stay there and and they they feel very safe and comfortable there so that's the only relevance the uk has it says it's the global money laundering hub that's all it is so uh, a free trade agreement between india and the uk i am not sure how much it will benefit india and the uk economy is declining india's economy is gathering steam and and expanding as it should so india won't gain much from accessing the small small and declining uk economy but for now we can have some kind of deal worked out with them and what how do we make sure these looters don't try to get in with india they are not in a position to try anything again with india the uk is no longer a world power it's not even a second class power it's a third rate power it's it's not in a position to uh, try anything with india the only thing is they have a significant media industry and that still influences the 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 minds of indians a lot because indians consume news and information in english mostly these days and that's why they still have some kind of uh, hold on the indian psyche that will be dealt with in due course in the due course of time so that's what i think of of the uk uh, not a big deal anymore and it's going to become even lesser of a deal as the years go by as it should right now uh, this topic here lipun says what's your view on the usa you the us has resumed imf bailout to pakistan giving aid and giving the clearance to pakistan's f16 up, up, upgradation Yasho says, "What are your views on the U.S. and Pakistan deal of 450 million U.S. dollars for upgrading Pakistani F-16 aircraft? Is it a consequence of Russia-India oil trading? When will we make our own aircraft?" Okay. Dhananjay says, "U.S. is giving 450 million worth of equipment for the F-16 sold to Pakistan, and should India consider American F-A-18 aircraft for INS Vikrant?" and for the multi role fighter aircraft programs isn't the us playing double games with india webov uh, says the uh, uh, the americans have approved this money for the f16 upgradation for to fight terrorism what's your view is the us again using pakistan to hurt india yes so the americans have announced this uh, deal this this package 450 million dollars worth of uh, upgrades to the pakistani f16 fleet so the pak these f16 fighter planes they date back to the 1970s they are still a reasonably good fighter plane yeah fourth generation i think yeah and they were uh, sold to pakistan and the condition was that it they would be used for anti terrorism activities now pakistan itself is a terrorist nation the whole world knows this so how do you expect terrorists to use this equipment for anti terrorism activities and everybody knows who pakistan truly wishes to, to target pakistan has only one enemy which it considers to be its mortal enemy that's india everyone knows these f16s will be used in a future war if it ever happens uh, with india right the target everyone knows is going to be india and they use the f16s after in the aftermath of, of the balakot uh, uh, terrorist uh, the bala the balakot air strikes that india did on pakistani terrorist camps right the pakistanis used their f16s against india 
And now the Americans are giving this big package to the Pakistanis, almost half a billion dollars worth, to upgrade their old F-16s and make them better. So what, how do we understand this? What do, we, what do we make of this? See, it's very clear. Things can be made as complicated as you want or as simple as you want. I like to keep things reasonably simple. This is a hostile action by the US against India. That's what it is. The Americans are arming India's mortal enemy with newer equipment. They are giving upgrades. This is a hostile, unfriendly act against India. There is no other way to see this. Yeah. So all those who say that, you know, you know some people in India are trying to, uh, you know, make, make a small deal of this, that, they, that uh, it's not a big thing or anything. It's a big deal. That tells you how much the Americans can be trusted. On the one hand, they say that India and the US have shared values and we believe in democracy and we believe in freedom and human rights and, you know, uh, Asia-Pacific strategy, common strategy. On the other hand, on, on and they want India to, they want to use India as a bulwark, as, as, a, as, a, as a counterweight to China. And they want India to, to toe their line. On the other hand, they're doing this. So why have they, they, they done this? So there are multiple reasons. First of all, India has not gone along with the US line vis-a-vis -vis the Russia-Ukraine situation. India has maintained an independent foreign policy and India has not allowed the US to dictate what we should do or what we should not do. Yes. And we have continued purchasing oil from the Russians. They don't, the Americans don't like this. And now India is participating in the Vostok exercises in the far east of Russia. Yes. So the Americans, again, don't like that. So India is making is sending signals to the Americans that we are going to have an independent foreign policy. We are a sovereign nation and we will not be told what to do. In response to that, the Americans are doing this and saying, look, this is what we can do to you. We can once again reopen the Pakistan option. If you, in case you don't remember, the Americans financed more than two decades of Pakistani terrorism on India. Nobody else financed it. The Americans knew what was happening. The Americans were financing Pakistani terrorism in India. The Mumbai attacks, 2008-2611, was a consequence of that. Even in the 1971 war, the Americans tried to bully India. The Americans knew what the Pakistanis were doing. They were conducting genocide in, in, in uh, Bangladesh. And the Americans were fine with this. So this is the American track record. They have never been especially pro-India. They've typically been very anti-India. They have used Pakistan to bleed India again and again for decades. Yes. And now they're again showing India that we still have the option to do that. So what should India do about this? India should continue having an independent foreign policy, looking out for India's national interest, seeking a multipolar world, constructing a multipolar world, building India's economy. That's what India should do. What about the FA-18? The Americans have offered the FA-18 to India. It's a fighter plane uh, for the INS Vikrant. The INS Vikrant will need about 30 or 35, 40 fighter planes. Typically, it's uh, the number is 30, but we need some extra, right? So 30, 35, 40 or something like that, we need fighter planes. The Americans have offered their FA-18 fighter plane. Should India go for it in the light of what they are doing, in the light of their aid to Pakistan? Uh, so that's that's something the government needs to take a call on. I have been, uh, I have been of the opinion that, that the Rafal should be considered. The Rafal won't fit into the into the lifts, the elevators of the INS Vikrant. So maybe some modifications can be done and something can be worked out, or we can see some other option, the, the MiG-29 or something. Yeah. So the US is playing double games with India. In the, US, the US always believes in coercive tactics, coercive methods, arm twisting, bullying. And we are seeing this. We are witnessing this again. Yeah. Uh, so yes, the Americans are up to their old tricks again. No matter how you paint this or portray it, this is a hostile and unfriendly action against India. Bhumika says, India lodges, uh, yeah, this F-16 thing is done, yeah. Mm. Secondly, India has pulled out of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Group trade pillar. How is this going to impact India-US relations? 
Har says Bharat pulled out of has pulled out of the IPEF trade pillar. Is it because of the F-16 uh, deal that the Pakistanis and China uh, and the Americans have going, or is it because India and China Bharat relations are improving as we have both pulled the army back? And Samarth says, why? What is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework (IPEF) launched recently by the US, and is it just a waste of time? Why is Taiwan not part of it? Okay. Uh, let me share my screen and let's take a look at what this IPEF is. I'm going to put, uh, uh, what shall I put on the screen? IPEF. I'm going to put a Wikipedia article on it. So once again, statutory warning, Wikipedia is not always reliable. In this case, I'm using it just for the sake of convenience because I'm just showing you the, the big picture. So the IPEF has, uh, I think, 14 nations. It's, a, it's something that has been launched in May this year, May 23 this year. It's the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. What a wonderful name it has. And it has all these Indo-Pacific nations, Australia, Brunei, Fiji, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, US, and Vietnam. So this essentially, once again, is the US. Uh, the, U, the Americans want to decouple from China. And uh, that's, uh, that's something that is in progress right now. So this is part of that. So they want to pull various nations in the Indo-Pacific region on the to the American side and against China. So that's what's happening. And all of these nations are, are nations that, that typically feel threatened by the Chinese uh, expans, expansionist uh, activities. So it makes sense for these nations to band together. And the Americans are the biggest economies, so they are leading this process. Yeah. So now, so this IPEF, let's put that back on the screen. Let's put that back on the screen. So it has four pillars. Yeah, four themes or four pillars. One is fair and resilient trade. Second is, second is supply chain resilience. Third is infrastructure, clean energy, decarbonization, whatever, not, whatever that is. And the fourth is tax and anti-corruption. The main thing is actually trade, fair and resilient trade. That is the major outcome that this entire thing seeks because that is where the power comes from, right? That's the real deal. So India has refused to become part of that particular pillar, the trade pillar. Why is this? So the ministry of whichever concerned ministry has put out some explanation as to why they, we have done this. They Essentially, what we are saying in diplomatic terms is that we want to uh, wait until the framework matures and, you know, see how it progresses and then we'll take a call on this. The actual reason could be retaliation to the US for their F-16 deal with Pakistan. It is very much a possibility. So we will not say that that's why we are doing it, but it is to be understood that these are, this is a you know, tug of war that's happening between, the, between India and the Americans. India is pursuing an independent foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, vis-a-vis -vis various other nations. India is pursuing a multipolar world uh, that's the kind of world India wants, and that's the kind of game India is playing, the geopolitical game. It is um, multi-alignment, not going into one person's camp, the big boy's camp. Yeah. In response to that, and India is also uh, uh, participating in the war games, the Vostok war games in the Far East of Russia. In response to that, the Americans are... So are, are they have done this deal with the Pakistanis, and they are offering... They are, they are selling Pakistan this big half a billion dollar worth of upgrades to the F-16 uh, fighter jet uh, flotilla. In response, India seems to have done this, that we will not be part of your of your trade pillar of the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. So this is a tit-for-tat, tit-for-tat happening right now. Yeah. And what we, we are seeing is that the, America, the Americans, the US is the only superpower in the world. It's, it is the biggest... Uh, biggest dog in the in the entire park right india is still a much smaller economy but india is still standing firm and india is uh telling the us that you cannot tell us what to do so that's what we are witnessing i don't know how far this will go and what are the consequences going to be like the americans are not happy clearly i mean i mean giving a big f16 upgrade to pakistan is is like crossing a certain line right it's like going back to the days of the cold war think about it the americans always accuse indians India of having a 20th century mentality. Of They accuse India always of having a Cold War mentality. Well, this particular step that the Americans have taken is nothing but Cold War mentality. 
this is the kind of thing they used to do during the Cold War in the 20th century, aiding Pakistan, supporting Pakistan against India. And they have reopened that playbook. So it is the Americans who are who have a Cold War mentality. And they are opening the same old playbook. So that's where we are. Yeah. The relations are not good between India and the US. There will still be cooperation on a number of matters, especially when it concerns China. But in but the Americans want India to bend over backwards and do whatever they say in all aspects of India's foreign policy, which is not going to work. And India is now rising. India's GDP grew by 13 point something percent in the first quarter of 2022. That is something which is sets of alarm bells in the West. The West doesn't want India to rise. The West wants India to stay, remain a middle income, I mean, a, a, a middle sized economy, mid sized economy, not a bigger economy. Five trillion would be a terrible disaster for them. Ten trillion, trillion would be the end of the world for them. They don't want India to go the China way. China rose and India has all the potential to rise. And that's why they will do everything they can to keep hindering India and keep uh, putting you know roadblocks in India's way. So India will have to find ways to deal with this. So this is what we are witnessing. This is what we are witnessing. So India has most likely refused to become part of the trade pillar of the Indo-Pacific economic framework in response to the various American actions that are clearly hostile to India. Okay, Kali says, why are China disengaging from line of actual control flashpoints? Does is, is Mr. Putin involved in mediating the dispute between India and China? Will India cancel the upcoming military exercise that was going to be held in Uttarakhand with US military after this disengagement? Ayush says, why is army the Indian army reorienting forces to boost combat readiness along the LAC in Arunachal Pradesh sector? Also, India and China troops begin disengagement from the Gogra hot springs region in Ladakh. What's going on? Okay, okay. What's going on is this. This coming week, I think on Thursday and Friday, there is the SCO summit, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Summit, I think in one of the Central Asian countries. I don't remember which one. Which with Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, somewhere there. Yeah. So there is the Shanghai Cooperation Summit that's going to happen this coming week, Thursday and Friday. And Mr. Modi, Prime Minister Modi, is going to most likely be meeting President Xi Jinping. Now, before such a meet, it is it is appropriate to take some you know de-escalation measures, you know token gesture of of kind of yeah we you know we, we will get along together and that sort of thing. So what the Chinese always do is this. Look at it this way. Think about it. The Chinese have the next five years calendar in front of them. They know where, which are the major summits in which the Indian Prime Minister and the Chinese President have to meet, and that's when they want to indulge in some diplomacy and maybe um, you know get things done. So they have a five-year calendar in front of them. So based on the calendar, they make various incursions along the line of control and they hold certain points that are disputed and, and you know, India claims it as its own and the Chinese say, no, it's our, ours. And they essentially indulge in provocations and they wait until a summit is going to happen and then they pull back. In order to make it look like, you know, we are being, uh, you know, we are being very accommodating to you. They first create a problem and then before a summit, they pull back as so as to look in front of the whole world like they are being very accommodating and, and very gracious. That's what they do. So that's what we are witnessing right now. Because there is a summit coming up in just a few days. That's why the Chinese are now withdrawing. And they are saying it's a mutual withdrawal. Even India is withdrawing from that place and we are de-escalating the whole matter, which is indeed the case. So India is also withdrawing. They are also withdrawing from that place. So for some time, it's going to be unoccupied for most intents and purposes and in the future they may choose to do it again what they have done you know so that is the situation there is a summit coming up and that's why this disengagement has happened is russia involved in mediation not at all russia has no business being involved in this and they know it very well the russians will not poke their nose where it doesn't belong yeah mr putin won't do that so russia is not involved in any any mediation of this the lsc dispute between india and china for other things maybe there is there could be some involvement which which may not be made public. But for the LSE issues, it's between India and China purely. Uh, will India cancel some upcoming military exercise in Uttarakhand with the US military after this disengagement? I don't see any reason why we should do that. I don't see any reason why India should do such a thing. Uh, 
why is army reorienting forces to boost combat readiness in arunachal pradesh because we should always be combat ready because we can never trust the chinese it's very simple so we are always in the process of reorienting forces and maintaining the highest amount of combat readiness to deal with any kind of chinese misadventure right so that's why we do it so that's the situation along the line of actual control the gogra hot springs region if you want to see where this gogra hot springs region is let's take a look at it on the map yes it's on the line of actual control uh, let's go to the map quickly briefly here is the map so let's go uh, to northern india to the uh, ladakh region so the gogra hot springs region is about 125 kilometers east of the city of leh the city of leh is the capital of the union territory of of ladakh so the leh, leh is over here yes and gogra is about 125 kilometers east of leh and it is to the north of the pangong lake right and that is obviously part of indian territory but it's on the line of actual control because china occupies parts of aksai chin etc illegally and we will deal with that, that in due course of time so this is the gogra region right it's as you can see uh, let's take a look at the satellite a uh, terrain uh, image this is the gogra region and this is where the disengagement is currently happening so it's all because of the upcoming summit and the chinese want to make it look like they are being very gracious and very kind and very accommodating which they are not this is the standard good old trick that they always play so it's nothing new for india vinu says is afghanistan Taliban regime pro Pakistan like everybody was saying last year or is it pro India what is taliban's foreign policy you had said in august 2021 that taliban is not anti india and india should find ways to cooperate with taliban has your prediction proved accurate okay is the tal if is afghanistan's taliban regime pro pakistan like everyone was saying do you think it's pro pakistan no the taliban regime is absolutely not pro pakistan they may have been created by the pakistanis yes in the 1990s through during the time of benazir bhutto etc by the isi and all but the taliban are almost exclusively pashtuns and they are all pashtun nationalists and they have a massive territorial dispute with pakistan they seek the so called pashtun pashtunistan region back the northwest frontier province khyber pakhtunwa all those regions they seek them back yes Uh, that is uh, the legacy of the british raj actually the, i will not go into that story so there is a big territorial dispute between pakistan and afghanistan and the taliban resent the fact that the pakistanis think that they still own them and they can still control pa- uh, afghanistan which is not happening and you can you can see you know intermittent reports from time to time of border clashes between afghanistan and Tal- uh, and the pakistanis yes So that's a, that's an ongoing thing and if you want to see the kind of sentiment the the people of afghanistan have towards pakistan you only need to see the the reaction in the aftermath of various cricket matches yeah the afghans hate pakistan yeah so the taliban is not pro pakistan is it pro india not quite pro india but it is certainly more pro india than pro pro pakistan i mean uh, india has is still training various afghan officials maybe soldiers etc yeah i'm not sure to what extent it's happening but recently i had seen some news of of a plane that landed in in kabul from delhi with uh, trained officers which is clearly officers that are under the taliban regime yeah so there is cooperation happening india has reopened various uh, embassies or whatever in afghanistan to some extent with the full cooperation and approval of the taliban and the taliban they have no issue with india absolutely not yeah so it is not exactly a pro india regime but it's much more friendly and positively inclined towards india than it is towards pakistan yeah now the other part of the question what is taliban's foreign policy the taliban doesn't have, don't have much of a foreign policy they welcome investments in afghanistan whoever does it whether it is china or russia or india they have invited india to continue what india was doing you know building up afghanistan building afghanistan infrastructure and all that and they have uh, i'm sure uh, Uh, given assurances of say of uh, security and all that so that's uh, that's the limited foreign policy they have they don't want much interference in their nation they want to govern their nation as as they see fit and that's what's happening uh, i had said in august 2021 yes the the american uh, withdrawal from afghanistan happened in august 2021 they just pulled out 
overnight without informing anyone right almost like that's what happened it was a period of great chaos in afghanistan yeah and all those terrible scenes on the kabul runway airport and all that uh, so i had said that at that time i had done uh, two or three live streams about afghanistan the, of the afghanistan crisis and i had indeed said like vinu says at that time that the taliban is not anti india they don't hold any grudges against india they may actually be positively inclined towards india because the pashtuns the afghans have 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 benefited a lot from what from the development work india has done in afghanistan the americans they poured in a lot of money into afghanistan but that was mostly used to give bribes and to buy politicians the investments that india has done in afghanistan actually served the afghan people whether it is dams whether it is uh, public buildings whether it is uh, investments in agriculture it all serves the common man woman and child and in the taliban their families have also benefited from that so if you if you look at the individual taliban uh, foot soldier and even the the officers etc they would actually have some some kind of positive feeling towards india so i had said at that time that the taliban is not anti india and you can see in the past year has taliban done a single thing that is anti india you can see lots of clashes with pakistan but do you have you seen a single thing that is in india there were many indian officials in kabul when this entire thing was happening when the scenario was unfolding the taliban did not stop india from taking out all of its citizens they did not you know uh hinder india in any way and they cooperated with india even at that time in the time of chaos and after their the, that time there has not been a single anti india action taken by the taliban so i had indeed said that india needs to find india should find ways to cooperate with the taliban i think this is happening at various levels it will not be publicized it will not be you know tom tommed from the rooftops but yes it's it's indeed happening uh, at a variety at, at various levels so i think my prediction has indeed proved accurate i was say i mean the things i said it actually uh, most people did not agree with it most people thought that uh, taliban will be a major security issue for india and we will see a um, upsurge of uh, terrorism and violence in kashmir in various parts of india absolutely none of that has happened like i said it would not happen so i think my predictions vis-a-vis -vis afghanistan have come have proven to be more or less accurate yeah so yeah so that's what i can say about this matter anonymous says is germany also occupied by the usa just like japan and who wrote the german constitution my goodness the questions you are asking <laughs> is germany also occupied by the us just like japan yes the americans have a number of permanent new, uh, military bases on german soil and these bases have been in place on german territory on german soil since 1945 this is called permanent occupation permanent military occupation look it up some people will say where are the references look it up yourself my dear friends i'm not going to spoon feed you fact check what i'm saying i am making a claim i am saying that there have there are permanent us military bases in germany that have been in place since the end of the second world war go ahead and do a fact check do a little bit of research of your own so yes germany is also occupied military occupation by the us just like japan yes that's part one of the question that's your answer look it up the second part of the question is who wrote the german constitution <laughs> who do you think wrote the german constitution okay let's go into that story uh so the german constitution um there was something called the frankfurt documents or whatever it was called this was a set of guidelines and principles and, and documents that were drafted by the western occupying powers the us the uk france and whoever else it was yeah who were occupying west germany so after the world war 2 germany was partitioned divided into the eastern bloc and the western bloc the eastern bloc the east german east germany was essentially occupied by the ussr and west germany was occupied by the americans and their their minions the uk france etc yeah that's what happened so germany was partitioned now when it comes to west germany a new constitution was created based on these frankfurt documents i think they were called 1948 49 somewhere around that time that the americans essentially uh, gave to the germans then a constituent assembly was 
selected not elected selected a constituent assembly was selected and this constituent assembly took those documents the frankfurt documents or and then they formulated the so called constitution based on that and before the constitution was became became came to came into force it was given the seal of approval the official seal of approval formally approved by the occupying western powers so this entire process was a sham there was nothing democratic about it and the constitution was you can say that some germans drafted it but it was all done under the strict and direct supervision of the occupying americans and essentially it is nothing but something that the americans have created yeah so they made it look like it was a kind of democratic process there was a constituent assembly we have done it through the due process yeah due process yeah that was a sham due process so in the case of japan the constitution was directly written by the americans in the case of germany there was an intermediate you know it was written by proxy but again by the americans so the german constitution is nothing but a constitution that was drafted and approved by the americans and that's what is still in force in germany today so germany just like japan is a nation that is under permanent american occupation it is not a free nation and you have elections and they elect chancellors and all but it's all under a constitution that has been created by a foreign occupying power so do you call this democracy really really i i know the system has continued for 70 plus years but it's not a democratic system Atharva says I was researching about global superpowers the US the United States surprised me the number of military bases alliances treaty uh, treaties etc they have is way too huge well good job sir you your eyes have been opened the number of military bases they have across the world is incredible they essentially occupy half the world more than half the world the americans military bases so uh, continuing it's nearly impossible to beat the us how can india replace us hegemony and become become a dominant global superpower by all means uh, includes economy military bases allies soft power etc right good question uh yes the us like you saying it's nearly impossible to beat the us yeah we have to understand that there are cycles in history typically an empire a superpower is an empire the superpower is like a global empire typically empires have a limited lifespan some have a lifespan of 100 years some 200 years some 300 years and you see these imperial cycles rise and fall rise and fall rise and fall throughout history this is a pattern that you see over and over and over and over again in history whether it is in china whether it is in india whether it's in europe or anywhere else empires rise and they eventually inevitably decline and fall because of internal reasons not because somebody from outside comes and destroys them or defeats them which happens sometimes but typically it is because of internal reasons yeah they 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 essentially eat away at themselves and destroy themselves they lose what made them great that always happens whether it's the roman empire whether it is the mongol empire whether whether it is various chinese empires various indian empires eventually it always declines this is what we are seeing now in real time when it comes to the anglo saxon empire which is a continuation of the british empire the british empire that on which the sun never set yeah the the us empire is a continuation of that that's what we call a superpower it is now visibly in decline so the question is how can india you replace us hegemony and become a dominant superpower india has to bide its time india has to build its economy india has to work very very hard every single citizen needs to contribute in his in his or her own way to the nation's economy as the economy grows india's hard power will grow right and when it comes to replacing an empire we can see various historical examples think about the nanda empire in the 3rd century bc right? was it 3rd century there about yeah third century bc the nanda empire which was uh, headquartered in patliputra magadh so the nanda empire was a massive empire that spanned much of india it was so massive and so powerful that alexander soldiered soldiers mutinied alexander had rampaged across europe 
and Western Asia. He had annihilated the incredibly powerful Persian Empire. And yet, when he came to the borderlands of India, his soldiers mutinied because they knew it was suicide to get, to go further eastwards and face the might of the Nanda Empire. So it was so massive, Alexander could not stand a chance against it. That's how powerful the Nanda Empire was. And yet, within 20 years, it was gone. And what replaced the Nanda Empire? The Mauryan Empire, which went on to become even more powerful. In just in less than two decades, an entire empire so powerful that it was too powerful for Alexander, that entire empire vanished, evaporated, and was replaced by the empire of Chandragupta Maurya. This one young man, Chandragupta Maurya, with the help of his great mentor, Vishnugupta Chanakya, in less than two decades, replaced this pre-existing great empire. It can happen. It can be done. Of course, you need somebody as, as vigorous and as capable as Chandragupta Maurya. And you need a great brain behind such a man. You need a Vishnugupta Chanaki of your own. If you had, have that combination, anything can happen. And you can see such things happen over and over again. Look at how massive the Chinese empire was. And the Mongols were this ragtag bunch of tribes who were always being made to fight each other by the Chinese. And then one fine day, this young man comes out of the Mongol, you know, uh, wild wild territory. His name was Temujin. He went on to unify the Mongol tribes under one banner. They called him Chinggis, Chinggis Khan. And he went on to annihilate China within one lifetime. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. So I'm not saying that India needs to go Chinggis Khan on the American empire. I'm not saying India needs to go Chandragupta Maurya and Chanakya on the US empire. The US empire is in decline. It's already in decline. We can see it declining. They are trying to fight it right now, but it's in decline. So India is, on the other hand, rising. The economy is growing. There is so much energy and potential in India. So much scope for progress. So India needs to take it easy. Not let me take that back. Not take it easy. India needs to keep its head down, bide its time and work as hard as it possibly can. And when I say India, I mean you all. Stop wasting time. Raise your standards. Work hard, work hard, work hard. And see what happens in 20 years time. The world will be unrecognizable. That's what's going to happen. Okay, enough geopolitics for a while. For a while. Let's take something else. Saurabh says, is there any evidence of rice agriculture in India 17 lakh years ago? Someone said this to me and it sounds weird. Uh, Saurabh, you know, if somebody says there was there is evidence of rice agriculture 17 lakh years ago, that I, I, I'm glad it sounds weird to you because it doesn't make any sense. Homo sapiens, our species, is 3 lakh years old. Yeah. 17 lakh years means 1.7 million, almost 2 million years before today. There can't be any agriculture because there was no evolved species of human at the time. Agriculture, rice agriculture is one is 17,000 years old. The oldest evidence of, of agriculture in India, proper cultivation, dates back to about 15,000 something BC in the Indian subcontinent. Where was this discovered? In Sri Lanka in the heartlands in the in the highlands of sri lanka so let me give you the let me let me show it to you for a, for a change let me show you some reference uh let me put something on the screen let me show you the article and you can look it up and find the uh, references within so this is an article by dr anil suri how old is indian agriculture right google it and you'll find it so what do we find here um, when did it actually begin, etc., etc. All right, this this one here, beyond the Holocene, agriculture in the Pleistocene. So, uh, to trace the tra trajectory from incipient cultivation as a dry crop, etc., we must journey south, indeed, as far down as the southern part of Sri Lanka, to the mesmerizingly beautiful Horton Plains National Park, to be precise. Here, there is evidence of cattle herding and grazing, etc 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 cultivation of edible plants and early management of barley and oats from 
15,500 BCE. That is 17 and a half thousand years before today. And you can read the rest of the article. I will not go and do it. But I, I invite you all to do that. So the earliest evidence of cultivation of crops in India, systematic cultivation of crops, dates back to 17 and a half thousand years before today in Sri Lanka. Now, some of you will say Sri Lanka is a different country. Talk about India. My dear friends, 17,000 years ago, the Ice Age was in force. The sea levels were much lower than it, what they are today. India and Sri Lanka were a single landmass. So Sri Lanka was physically part of the Indian subcontinent at that time. Do you understand that? Sri Lanka was part of India. It was connected. There was no break. There was no ocean between India and Sri Lanka. It was just the same landmass. It was part of the South Indian Peninsula, Sri Lanka. All right? So the oldest evidence of agriculture, rice agriculture in India and most likely in the entire world is from Sri Lanka, present day Sri Lanka, 17 and a half thousand years before today, not 17 lakh. So somebody must have read this and they must have quoted it wrong. All right. So that is the answer. Rishab says, why did Zoroastrians from Iran escape to India through the sea route? Why didn't they come through the land route? Even if some did come through the land route, which I believe, why is there no evidence regarding this? There is no evidence because they came through the sea route. The Zoroastrians, the Persians, our, our Persian Parsi brethren and sisterin who escaped from Iran during the Arabic invasion and during the Arabic invasion of Iran, they escaped to India by ships and by boats. And they landed in, in Gujarat, in Western India, in a place which is now called Zanja, Sanjan, which was named after their hometown of Zanjan in Persia. Shall we take a look at where, where it is? Because why not? We, we love the map, don't we? Where's the map? Here's the map. Here it is. Where's the map? Here's the map. Okay, let's take a look at uh, where is Zanjan in Iran? Z-A-N-J-A-N, Zanjan. Here is the, the town of Zanjan in, in Persia. It's in northern Persia, right? It's near the Caspian Sea region. And these Persians, these Parsis, Zoroastrians, who escaped to India in order to preserve their religion and, and their culture, they landed somewhere in western India, in, in Sanjan, which is, I don't know, somewhere here, I believe. And they, some of them live in, in Navsari, Valsad, have you heard of Farooq Balsara? Farooq Balsara, Freddie Mercury, a famous singer. So he was Indian, Zoroastrian and so on. Okay, so the question is, why did the Parsis, Zoroastrians, escape through the sea route? Why not through the land route? Because the Arabs did not have the capability to pursue them by sea. The Arabs did not invade Persia through the sea route. The Arabs did not have any naval capabilities. The Arabs invaded uh, Persia through present-day Iran, and there were multiple battles. It was not an overnight thing, but it was very rapid. The Arab advance into Iran was very rapid. So the Iranians, the Persians who wanted to uh, escape, they did so through the sea route because the Arabs had no ability to pursue them by sea. If they had tried to escape to India via uh, Balochistan, etc., present-day Pakistan, temporarily, what is Pakistan, then the Arabs could have pursued them and, and hunted them down. But because they escaped by sea, the Arabs were not able to catch up with them because the Arabs did not have any naval capabilities. And that's what happened. That's how the, the, the Persians ended up in Western India, in Gujarat. And we know the story. We know the story after that. I, I hope you all know the story. So that's the answer. That's why they <clears throat> escaped through the sea route, not the land route. Sahil says, where did all the Huns, Parthians, Kushans, Scythians, etc., who invaded India, where did they disappear? Are they still living in India? How can we identify them? I want to meet them. Mm, I want to meet them. The Scythians, the Kushans, the Parthians, and so on and so forth. See, it's like this, my dear friends. Even the Greeks, the Yavanas, invaded India. They made kingdoms in northwest India, present day Gand I mean, Gandhar, present day Afghanistan, in parts of present day Pakistan, Punjab, and so on and so forth. Uh, even western India, Gujarat, Saurashtra, etc., for some time was, was uh, ruled by the Yavanas, the Ionians, which is the Greeks, and so on. 
then these indo greek kingdoms uh went out of power and they were replaced by the scythians the mahakshatrapas the scythians later the kushans up north kanishka and his 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 merry men and so on and so forth right and then there were these various hunnic invasions into india which were first of all repelled by the great gupta emperors including skand gupta during the time of his father kumar gupta a whole story there but eventually after the gupta era ended the huns were also able to make inroads into india there was a very cruel king called uh, mihirakula very evil guy very bad guy and there were some good hunnic kings as well eventually and eventually even the hunnic age ended so the question is a very good question where are all these guys the yavanas where did they go did they all go back to greece absolutely not what about the parthians the prithu people the parthians were anyway uh, a vedic clan the prithu clan so they were not foreigners right the huns were foreigners they came from central asia they looked different they had elongated heads and they had typical uh, what we call mongoloid features yes the greeks the yavanas were well they came from greece the ionian sea region yeah uh, the kushans and the scythians were of indian origin so they are not really some some geniuses always tell me abhijit you are so wrong the kushans were the yuchi the chinese called them yuchi and they were turks or whatever they were huns or whatever they were they were from central, central asia how can you say they are indians you are so wrong are bhai <laughs> the kushans lived in what was once called uttarakuru right who founded uttarakuru who lived in uttarakuru various vedic clans the scythians they lived in what we once called uttaramadra they were also of indian origin if you look at history from this narrow perspective you will see a certain version of history but if you took take a look at a bigger time frame your entire perspective will change and you will see so much more information so please try to look at the picture holistically instead of looking at narrow time periods and then giving gyan <laughs> okay so what happened the huns the the kushans the scythians the greeks they all assimilated into the indian population they didn't go back anywhere they had the the, the greeks stayed they ruled over parts of india for 2 300 years the kushans ruled for almost half a century half a century century the scythians the mahakshatrapas ruled very well in western india in gujarat they were the the lords and protectors and servants of the great ancient jyotirlinga shrine of somnath so the mahakshatrapas did a very good job of ruling western india gujarat saurashtra etc they were very good rulers by all accounts and uh, even the huns later were very good rulers the great um, the hunnic ruler vyagramuk who ruled in binmal in in uh, rajasthan in the rajasthan region he was the patron of the great scientist brahmagupta a hunnic king was the patron of the great indian scientist astronomer mathematician brahmagupta so all these kings all these rulers eventually became indian they they would have married indian ladies in among royalty right this guy uh vyagramukha he belonged to the to the sri chapa dynasty which was an indian dynasty not, not a hunnic dynasty so it looks like he took took the name of an of of an indian dynasty right and so on so they gradually assimilated and after the, see they would not have come in enormous numbers in india right typically these invasions there is an invasive invasive force maybe 10 20 30 000 people and they would be good warriors and that's why they won because india was temporarily in a in a place in, in a time period where there was disunity that happens from time to time and that's how these invaders were able to succeed but eventually they ruled over india they became good rulers they assimilated into the indian population and so where are they today they are part of the indian population most people in northern india western india whether it is afghanistan whether it is the temporary nation of pakistan whether it is gujarat rajasthan punjab haryana and other parts of india all the way to the south etc everybody would have maybe 1% of 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 yavana blood maybe 1% kushan blood maybe 1% hunnic blood maybe 3% scythian blood and so on they are nowhere to be found they are all among us they are us now they have become part of us if you are in any of these parts of india you would have a little bit small fractional amount of ancestry from these ancient peoples 
and that's that's the answer right you can't identify them anymore they are you you most likely would have a little bit of ancestry sahil and as would most of us yeah arya says is it true that most of the egyptian mummies are gone because the british ate them the truth is that many egyptian mummies are gone because the british and other europeans ate them and i think most people will be shocked to hear this most people will be shocked to hear and most people will not believe what i'm saying yeah the practice of eating <laughs> egyptian mummies began i believe in the 12th century so around this time mummies were exported from egypt see at that time egypt was ruled, ruled by the arabs the entire culture and religion of egypt had changed and there was no sacredness associated anymore with the egyptian mummies the mummies of their ancestors right so egypt used to sell mummies to the european nations at that time the the uh various uh exchanges cultural exchanges and other exchanges between the islamic world the arabic world and the in the christian or european world were already going on right and that's how the indian knowledge was transferred to to europe indian mathematics and science and all that so at that time the arabs were ruling the mamluks were ruling egypt yes and the europeans were very curious about egyptian mummies and these mamluks and the whoever was ruling egypt would sell mummies to europeans and europeans they had this weird thing that at that time there was no medicine right there was only things people believed various things so it was believed that these mummies were the mummies of egyptian kings and it was believed that mummies they held spirit the spirit you know the life spirit of the ancient egyptian kings and therefore if you consume that then your health will improve and will become much better so the european royalty used to consume powders made by grinding up egyptian mummies and that practice eventually made its way into the civilian non royal non aristocratic population as well and after after a century or two the egyptians they imposed a ban on exporting mummies but by the time fake mummies were created and that practice continued and even the 18th and 19th century you would have uh, centuries you would have these various egyptians selling mummies on the road side you know that sort of thing so yes a significant number of egyptian mummies were ground up into powder and consumed i think there was a powder called mumia or something that the europeans used to eat and they believed it would give them better health it would cure various illnesses and diseases and all that and there was a lot of cannibalism in europe you know uh the british royalty they would be given various ointments and medicines made from human skulls and various uh, ointments made from human fat would be used as ointments or to treat diseases like gout and various other things you know so that's the kind of practice you had in europe for for a very long time a uh, human skull extracts were given to british royalty until the beginning of the 20th century yeah so from the 12th century until the 20th century these barbaric primitive brutal strange bizarre practices continued in europe and in the uk cannibalism actual cannibalism so i uh, i'm not sure how many mummies were consumed and afterwards what happened is that mummies became a big craze in 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 uh, europe and there used to be these mummy unwrapping parties so a bunch of rich people would get together they would get drunk and then they would they would have procured a mummy and then they would unwrap the mummy and make it naked and there was something supposedly entertainment for them and that that showed you how rich you were because it was quite expensive to procure a mummy you know mummies by that time were quite rare and they were not readily available so if you could procure a mummy which came from egypt it 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 showed your status as a very wealthy person and then you would invite all your wealthy friends rich friends and you would all have a party all get drunk and then you would unwrap the mummy and that sort of thing so i don't know what kind of incredibly bizarre practices were were in vogue in europe but yes it is indeed true that europeans consumed egyptian mummies and 
even fake egyptian mummies so cannibalism cannibalism was an accepted practice in europe until the 20th century i don't know how it is now I, i'm sure it's not it's not there now but yeah interesting isn't it my dear friends okay that's a whole lot of questions vampires mm, i'm scared now mm. akash says woman vampire skeleton found in poland does it make the stories we heard about vampires true um shubham says what's your take on the vampire skeleton found in poland jay says what's your thought on recent archaeological discovery of female vampire skeleton in poland do vampires exist and vinay says sir female vampire skeleton discovered in poland what is a vampire and how can a human become a vampire i am so scared now oh my god okay <laughs> let's deal with this question uh let us put the news item on the screen shall we yeah let's do that let me share my screen female vampire skeleton so what did you find let's take a look at what was actually discovered right uh come on screen here we are let's remove this and let's see the screen so it says a 17th century vampire grave discovered in poland of a skeleton with a sickle across her neck so this uh, unfortunate person is a lady young lady apparently and she was buried with this hooked sickle across her neck uh and are there more images there it is can you see this so this unfortunate person was buried in this manner clearly somebody put a sickle across the neck and uh the vampire folklore was very much prevalent in in europe especially eastern europe poland is in eastern europe north of uh, of romania transylvania where these uh, legends actually perhaps originate the nosferatu legend if you watch the movie dracula and so on <laughs> yeah so this is what they discovered so what does this signify does it mean that this unfortunate lady was an actual vampire did she drink human blood does it mean that so here's what it means see uh in the old days people did not understand the uh various diseases that happened in some cases certain diseases looked like someone is under vampire attack there was an illness called consumption consumption in which people would lose blood through cough they would cough up blood and slowly and slowly the they, they would become paler and they would look like they have lost a lot of blood because their lungs would be coughing up blood consumption is today called tuberculosis all right so there was already this ancient myth of the nosferatu in the transvil transylvania region of romania and europeans were extremely superstitious yes they believed in this these demonic entities called vampires and then you had various uh, an in inexplainable diseases that, that would come in from time to time and they would blame it on the supernatural forces and then you would have you would have people who would have tuberculosis consumption their their clothes would be bloody you know they would wake up in the morning from night and they would be pale and they would have blood on their mouth and neck and all that it would look like they have been assaulted by a vampire in the night and the belief was that if one if a person has been bitten by a vampire then after they die they don't really die they become the undead and they come back in the night out of the grave and they attack other living people that was the belief right and so to prevent that from happening they would there would be like a couple of things they would do they would put a stake through the heart of the dead person in the hope that the person won't rise again and in in some cases they would put a big stone or a brick in the mouth of the dead person so that they can't come back and bite somebody <laughs> yeah and in some cases you would have this sort of thing they would put a sickle across the neck of the deceased person in the hope that that would prevent the person from uh, arising from their from the sleep yeah from from the, from the grave various uh various myths and superstitions so what is the origin of the vampire myth so the vampire is a person who has died but who is not who is not completely dead that person still is able to arise at night and they come and prey on the living and drink their blood this is in a way similar to the uh, concept of the supernatural being called the preta in indian ancient indian mythology so the preta is a, a spirit 
that has a very strong longing for certain things you know a spirit that has been not been fulfilled in its life and had a bad death or whatever and it has a certain longing maybe it 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 has a curse on it so it it longs for blood or some other things like that you know unhealthy longings and the same preta mythology is found in southeast asia in china they call it the hungry ghost and it's so the vampire myth seems to be similar to these these myths so certain myths they they persist across time and space and all that so that's the thing so that is what this vampire skeleton discovery means what it means is that she this unfortunate lady this person was not really a vampire obviously but people must have believed that she's a vampire because of something like that maybe she suffered from tuberculosis maybe she had consumption and maybe they thought that she may rise again from the dead and that's why they put a sickle across her neck when they buried her so let the archaeologists do more research they can maybe sample the chest area you know the rib cage area and see if they can find any uh, any any evidence of uh, tuberculosis bacilli over there in the microscopic uh, whatever they can dust up from there and maybe we'll have a better idea of what was going on maybe she had tuberculosis consumption and maybe they maybe that's why it looked like maybe the people felt that she is a candidate from for becoming a nosferatu a vampire in her afterlife Tejas says, why do more and more people believe that China is the origin of Buddhism? It's very simple. Marketing, propaganda. You take a lie, you construct a lie, and then you repeat it over and over and over again. And you don't do it yourself alone. You recruit a thousand other people to do the same thing. So now you have a thousand people repeating the same lie over and over and over again. And that's when lies become the truth. that is how propaganda works that's how marketing works just bombard the same message over and over again the chinese are trying to claim buddhism for their own now the chinese communist party says that the, that buddhism is a chinese religion they say it's a chinese indigenous religion right and if you look at various uh, uh western depictions of of the lord gautam buddha they depict gautam buddha as a person with eastern asian features with chinese like features not indian features Yeah, that's the popular imagination in the West of what Buddha was of Gautam Buddha, and the Chinese are are doing their best to to take this further. So they what they want to do is they want to capture the Buddhism tourism market. There is a huge uh, potential for religious tourism vis-a-vis Buddhism, and the Chinese want to capture that. the the heartland of buddhism is magadh it is the magadh region the patliputra region the gaya region the lumbini region right that region and uh, the place where the lord buddha en- uh, attained enlightenment uh, the bodhi tree where it was that is all in in bihar right in in present day bihar that should be where all the buddhism uh, tourism happens but uh, unfortunately uh it's not very well maintained and all that it's hard for tourists to reach there and the accommodation etc is not great and so on so the chinese will do their best to to capture the market they will build brilliant beautiful stupas and pagodas and and five star hotels and give all the facilities to people to come there and that's how they will benefit from the international buddhist tourism market so the chinese want to capture it even when it comes to the shaolin temple Two or three years ago, if you went to the Shaolin Temple website, it was clearly said on the Shaolin Temple's official website that the first patriarch of the Shaolin Temple is the Indian monk Buddha Dharma, and he is the founder of Kung Fu. He is the person who taught what is now Kung Fu to the Chinese. It was clearly mentioned there. Today, if you go to the website of the Shaolin Temple, it is very hard to find any such reference. Yeah. so everything all the truth is being expunged and a new narrative is being woven and and people it's very it's very easy to sway people's minds with with good marketing so that's what the chinese are doing and i'm i wonder why india is not doing anything because the truth lies with india gautam buddha was indian right and buddhism was born was was it it emerged out of india both the dharma which is one of the one of the flavors of overall dharma under the dharmic umbrella both the dharma emerged in india so india is the homeland 
of Buddhism, of both the Dharma, of Lord Buddha, and all that. It's it's a golden opportunity. It's it's like low hanging fruit waiting to be plucked, but nothing is being done. So the Chinese are taking advantage of that, and now more and more people believe that China is the origin of Buddhism, especially in the West. So it's something we can still rectify. You know, if the government gets its act together, especially the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, which I would say is one of the one of the uh, not very well performing ministries of the government of India. Krishna says, how come the Japanese embraced Buddhism but were hostile towards Christianity? How come? What is the reason? Well, it's like this, my dear friends. When it comes to Dharma, both Dharma, which are Dharma, the Japanese found that people who became practitioners of, of Dharma, whether it is both the Dharma or whatever form, they remained 100% Japanese and they were completely devoted to the service of their motherland, Japan. Yes? You may not know this, but for centuries in Japan, the consumption of meat was prohibited because of the influence of Dharma. And it is a misconception that the, Jap- that the Japanese are pure Buddhists. You will find every single non-Buddhist Hindu deity, divinity, represented in Japan. Whether it is Saraswati, who is called Benzaitin, whether it is Lord Ganesh, who has a Japanese name, whether it is Lord Shiva, whether it is Lord Mahakal, whether it is uh, Lakshmi, every single non-Buddhist Hindu god and goddess is represented in the Japanese polytheistic pantheon. It is now called Buddhism. Yeah. Anyhow, that's a whole different story. So I think uh, Buddhism or Dharma entered Japan at least 1500 years before today. It entered Japan via China. So the the Chinese were deeply interested in becoming Dharmic. Yes, their kings, their emperors would send requests to Indian kings and emperors for India to send Buddhist scholars, Vedic scholars to China, who would then go there and translate sutras and, and Sanskrit texts into Chinese. And slowly the Chinese became Indianized, right? You still see that today, whether the, whether the Chinese like it or not, it's there. A significant amount of the Chinese culture comes out of India. They have absorbed it and made it their own. Then that propagated further east into Japan, why China. Of course, a few Indian scholars, Dharma gurus also did go into Japan and set up monasteries there with royal approval. Yes, it happened. So... Uh, Buddhism, so to say, has been in Japan for at least 1,500 years. And the Japanese always observed that when Japanese citizens, civilians, kings, uh, samurai, warriors, etc., they became practitioners of Dharma, whether it's Buddhism or whatever, they remained completely devoted to the service of their motherland. Now, when Christianity entered Japan, about 500 or so years ago, roughly, roughly, give or take, the Japanese observed that those Japanese who became Christians, don't take my word for it, look it up yourself. The Japanese observed that those Japanese who became Christians tended to become anti-nationals. And they would indulge in activities that would be counterproductive to the Japanese national interest. And that's why the Japanese became very hostile towards Christianity. This is a fact. Look it up yourself. Fact check me. I will not give you sources. You can look it up yourself. It's all available online. It's all available in the public domain. Do a little bit of fact checking. Please go ahead. All right. Feel free. Samarth says, how should India deal with Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, etc.? Turkey has been involved in anti-India activities and terrorism as well. Should India be more assertive? Uh, Turkey is not a Central Asian country. Mm -mm -mm. Turkey is not a Central Asian country. Let's put the map on. Yes. Uh, Let's do that. Let's take a look at what Central Asia actually is. Uh, For some reason, I'm looking at Gujarat. Let's close that. Here's the map. Look, where is Turkey? It's a Mediterranean nation. It's over here. What is Central Asia? All of this is Central Asia. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, etc. All of this is Central Asia. Turkey is way, way to the west. It's a Mediterranean nation. It occupies present it occupies Anatolia. 
right? Uh, so, so let's forget about Turkey for now. We know what Turkey is up to. Turkey has always been an anti-India nation, more or less, in the past 70 or so years. So the question is, how should India deal with the Central Asian nations? Like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, so on. So apart from Tajikistan, the other Central Asian nations are Turkic nations. Tajikistan is an Indo-Iranian nation. The people, they speak, you could say they are an extension of greater Iran, Tajikistan. Okay. Uh, the other nations, whether it is Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, East Turkestan, currently occupied by China, etc. These are all Turkic nations. Now, India, see, if you if you look here, let, let's take the example of Kyrgyzstan. Yes? Can you see where Kyrgyzstan is? It's right north of India. It's almost like a stone's throw away from India, but nobody in India knows that this nation exists. It's practically a neighboring country of India. Just a few kilometers north. Okay, let's say the distance from Leh from Leh to, 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 to okay, for some reason. It's about 500 or so kilometers, maybe 700 kilometers, which is not a big distance in, in the big perspective. So Kyrgyzstan is here and I would say that all these nations are very favorably inclined towards India. There is no element of of, of uh, hostility towards India. There is no cause for these neighbors, or for these nations to have any ill feeling or ill will towards India. Yeah, We don't have any border disputes. We don't have shared boundaries. A long, long time ago, during the time of Genghis Khan, India and Central Asia had a common border, which was around this region in Tajikistan, when Afghanistan was a part of India. But that's long gone. So all these nations, I, I don't see why India can't have excellent, friendly and warm relations with these nations. I think India should take the time to invest in uh, forming good relations with these countries. Maybe we should uh, have direct flights to these nations. I am sure a nation, a wonderful nation like Kyrgyzstan could benefit from an influx of Indian tourists. Yes, they have this wonderful lake over here called the Isik Kul Lake. Very pretty lake. And they have a very beautiful country. Similarly, uh, when it comes to Tajikistan, very nice mountainous country. Uzbekistan is nice. Kazakhstan is a huge, huge country. One of the most, one of the largest countries in the world. Yes. So uh, there's a great amount of potential for tourism. There's a great amount of potential for Indian investments in these countries for for whatever business uh, opportunities are available there. So I think India should take the time to engage with these nations. Nowadays, India is doing that. There is this multi-pronged diplomacy that we are doing. And some of these nations are part of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization. So that also we can do, but they, the Chinese are involved there. So all of these nations would, I would guarantee you, would be much more favorably inclined towards India than towards China. Yeah, And these nations, uh, Russia considers these nations, the Central Asian nations, to be part of its uh, exclusive sphere of geopolitical influence. And we can leverage that also because we have excellent relations with Russia. So I think India should deal in a very positive way with these Central Asian nations. If we can have direct flights available from various parts of India, I, I'm sure Indian tourists would love to go there. The people there are very nice, very welcoming, very warm. Yeah. So uh, there is a huge scope, huge potential for uh, people to people contacts, maybe business contacts and overall warm, diplomatic, friendly relations between these nations and India. Uh, so India should explore these opportunities for sure. Siddesh says, will European nations remain united in the coming years? No. If Europe is peaceful and united and has been so in the past 70 years since 1945, it is simply because the most powerful, the greatest power in Europe today, in Western Europe today, is the United States. It is the United States through its puppet organizations, NATO and the European Union, that has maintained stability and peace in Europe for its own benefit, right? And the Americans actually occupy much of Europe. They have nuclear weapons 
in various parts of Europe, American nuclear power weapons on European territory, on the territory of various European nations. And the Americans have multiple permanent military bases in various parts of Europe. So Ameri America essentially occupies, in one way or the other, much of Western Europe. And much of Western Europe is controlled in a variety of ways by the Americans. The American power is now declining. We are seeing that. As this happens, Europe will become more assertive. And all the old enmities, all the old tribal enmities in Europe will re-emerge. There are old disputes, old scores that need to be settled, dating back to the Napoleonic Wars, the Crusades, the Balkan Wars, and so much more. It's, it's a tinderbox. As U.S. power declines, and as U.S. control over Europe declines, you're going to see more and more problems re-emerge in Europe. So I do not, do not see Europe remaining united in the coming years. The European Union will persist for maybe a couple of decades, maybe three decades. I don't know how long it will persist. But eventually it will all fall apart. Europe is currently united, which is it is done through an external force. It is artificially united. These various peoples, they have nothing much in common. And they have a lot, <laughs> a lot of bad memories of each other. That's going to re-emerge at some point in time. So I don't see Europe remaining united in the long term. Monica says, what's your take on Yogi Adityanath's uh, UP Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath's statement that Uttar Pradesh will become a $1 trillion economy state. I think it will happen. And I think it should happen as soon as possible. I think it will be great for India and for the great state of Uttar Pradesh if this happens. It is time that India becomes prosperous again. If you look at Uttar Pradesh, it once was the heartland, the historical heartland of India. Yet, the great Mahajanapada, some of the most prosperous and most powerful Mahajanapadas were in the heart of UP. The coastal Mahajanapada, Kashi, and many more. The great kingdom of Ayodhya is in the heart of UP. These were some of the most powerful kingdoms and empires in India and some of the most prosperous regions in India. So it is time for the great people of UP and the great state of UP to re-emerge. There is an incredible amount of potential in Uttar Pradesh and in neighboring Bihar. Bihar is Magadh. Bihar used to be, for thousands of years, the real seat of power in India. Patliputra, before Patliputra, you had Rajgrih, present-day Rajgir. These states were the old ancient powerhouses, politically and economically, of India. It is time for them to re-emerge. And there needs to be this healthy competition between Indian states. All of them should aspire to be $1 trillion economies. And more than that, Bihar should do that. UP should do that. I would like Arunachal Pradesh to do that and Tripura also to do that. And Kalinga, Orissa, to also become a $1 trillion economy state. Right? All the Indian states need to have this wonderful, healthy rivalry and competition amongst each other as to who will perform the best economically. It's like a sports team in which you're all working together, but you're all still trying to be the best player in the team. That sort of thing. That is great for the team. It's great for the overall cause of the team, for the campaign that you are all working towards. Yeah. So that needs to happen. And uh, I completely agree with uh, Yogi Ji's statement that it's going to happen. It will certainly happen. And I look forward to that happening as soon as is humanly possible. Descendant of Rig Vedic clan says, what is the transitive Brahmi script? Dr. Neeraj Rai tweeted early wheat evidence. Okay, let's take one question at a time. Yeah. What is the transitive Brahmi script? Uh, transitive Brahmi script is an older version of the Brahmi script. So if you look at the uh, mainstream consensus literature about Brahmi, they say that Brahmi emerged around 500 BC, the Brahmi script. They, most historians and most textbooks and history books will say Brahmi emerged around 500 BC. And they say, they make this claim that Brahmi is a descendant of the Aramaic script, which is a Semitic script. And Aramaic, this, this script is a descendant of the old Phoenician script, whatever that is, not important, right? 
the problem for for these claims is that there is an older version of the brahmi script which they call which is which could be called the transitive or transitional brahmi script which is midway between the saraswati sindhu script and the brahmi script dr subhash kak who has been on on this channel twice already in 1990 he published a paper i don't I'm not sure if i have it here yep he published a paper in 1990 in uh, in which he did a comparison a comparative analysis the top 10 most frequently occurring symbols in the saraswati sindhu script or the indus pali script and the 10 most common symbols in the brahmi script put them side by side and compare them and you can see clear similarities right so it is clear actually that the brahmi script emerged from the old script the saraswati sindhu script and there was a transitive phase in between uh, so that is called the transitive brahmi script it dates back to about 1500 bc which predates the aramaic script because the aramaic script emerged around 800 or 900 bc maybe 850 bc but the, the transitive brahmi script emerged about 1500 bc much before the birth of the uh, aramaic script that totally destroys this claim that the brahmi script is a descendant of the aramaic script and it all came from abroad mm-hmm. so that is what the transitive brahmi script is and much more research needs to be done but i think uh, some people are doing very good progress on deciphering the saraswati sindhu script uh, there is this uh, gentleman called yajnadevam i still haven't studied his paper but i will do it soon yeah so there's good progress happening <laughs> why why is there gandhari statue in, in every court in india <laughs> so gandhari was this uh, this lady in ancient india she she uh, she was the mother of the kauravas of the mahabharata era yeah and uh, she she was married to this uh, the, the the blind king dhritarashtra and because she in solidarity with her husband she decided to put a bandage on her eyes and never open her eyes again that sort of thing so she had she was blindfolded and in every indian court these days you have this statue this this statue of a lady who is blindfolded who's who's, held, who's holding this balance right so that statue is a, is what they call lady justice because justice should be blind should be impartial that sort of thing so it's not gandhari but yeah nice joke <laughs> um dia says curious to know do you have an editor assistant or do you do all the work by yourself do you read all the comments here which takes a lot of time or do you read only a few questions and select good ones do i have an editor or assistant i have a secret army of minions who do all the work for me i just sit here and do nothing uh, do i read all the comments it, i try to read as many comments as i can it does take a lot of time but i mean if i want to respect my viewers i should read all the comments especially the ones which have the ask abhijit hashtag so i actually do that yeah i spend significant amount of time reading the comments and then i select the questions that make sense you know there are always lots of great questions and i can only take like 20 30 questions per session so unfortunately you know time is limited and i only i can only take a few questions so i try to do as many as i can so i do read all the comments with the uh, hashtag ask abhijit or as many of them as i can i also do have a moderator so right now i am doing this live stream somebody is moderating the live chat yeah and i have mo- um, moderators who actually look at the other comments also and they do whatever work is required for that so i don't look into all those things but i do look at all the comments with the hashtag because that's what i need to do to answer your questions and i should select the questions myself instead of having them having somebody else select that from me to so select the the questions for me so that's what i do sudesh says will you be ready to go to mars if you get a chance uh, if if our friend elon musk offers me a ticket to mars i will be happy to go with the with the condition that i should be able to return to earth yeah i i would love to go out into space i would love to go to mars if i ever do get the opportunity um yeah i mean i since i was a kid i always was fascinated with space space travel all that so if i ever get the opportunity it would be the greatest thing of course i don't mind investing a couple of setting aside a couple of years to do that a one way trip to mars takes about 9 months or so uh, in the right uh, launch window 
so yeah i don't mind doing that provided uh, i'm i'm guaranteed that i do come back to earth so in that case i would certainly be happy to do that so my dear friend elon if you listen if you're listening i'm i'm up for it <laughs> all right all right all right so let's take some questions from the live chat shall we live chat why do i have a longer hair because i like a longer hair I, i'm a lazy you know uh, when the pandemic started i stopped stopped having a haircut and then then it just continued but at least i do shave so yeah there's no real reason for it just something that happened and then i then i ran with it okay what else do we have do we have any other interesting questions tell me about napoleon napoleon monsieur bonaparte was actually uh, from uh, the, the island of uh, what is it called S- what is that island called corsica corsica he was his mother tongue was italian but yes he so within a span of 20 years he went from complete obscurity to becoming the emperor of france in italy an incredibly meteoric rise and of course he was a very ambitious person maybe too ambitious for his own good and long story one of the greatest generals we have seen in in history but he was too ambitious for his own good and he eventually ended up destroying himself and his nation with him with himself i mean imagine trying to invade russia in winter he, he knew winter is coming and yet he invaded russia he actually succeeded in taking moscow but it was a hollow victory because the russians gave up moscow but only after burning the whole city so they said okay go ahead go ahead take up uh, go and sit in this burnt out city so napoleon spent a month in burnt out moscow and then eventually he had to retreat but not before the russian winter destroyed his army terrible terrible destruction anyhow that's a bit about napoleon i mean it's a very long story you know when will india approximately become a 10 trillion dollar economy are we going in the right direction the first step is 5 trillion dollars i am hopeful that by 2025 we will become a 5 trillion dollar economy it is still a steep a uh, path it may not happen but i am hopeful that we will reach there by 2025 so you don't look so far ahead right now you need to look you need to see so when you're climbing a mountain you never look at the peak you look right in front of you where am i putting my foot next next step next step you keep doing it you keep doing it eventually you end up at the top of the mountain so the next step for india is the 5 trillion dollar economy mark we have done a good job by eclipsing the the british by by going past the uk we are now the five, fifth largest economy next step next stop is 5 trillion dollars hopefully by 2025 and um maybe by 2030 at least by 2035 we should be at the 10 trillion dollar mark that's what i'm hopeful for it should be very much possible uh, okay any other questions do we have any other interesting comments um messi or ronaldo messi or ronaldo i i think both are great both are unique in their own way and maybe ronaldo is overall a better performer maybe maybe i haven't followed football much of late so don't know for sure but yeah both are great um Bobby says every sector needs to grow i completely agree every sector needs to grow you cannot you cannot focus on only some things and and neglect other things everything every sector of the economy and the nation needs to grow i completely agree uh where else are, what else do we have do we have something else interesting let me take one or two more questions if there is something that catches my eye Uh, there was no need of picking question of Europeans eating mummies. I was having my my dinner. Well, it it uh, piqued my curiosity and I found it interesting. So, why do you talk boring questions? Don't watch. I think I take very interesting questions. I have very good taste in questions. All right. Uh, are you into fitness? Yes, I'm into fitness. Where are my boxing gloves? I like to box, you know, punching bag workouts. My typical punching bag workout is 5000 punches. That's a whole lot of punches. I try to squeeze that into 60 minutes and I need to take care of my fists because that's a 
very high volume of punching and i also lift weights and all that yeah so i i certainly am into fitness a huge fan of fitness a huge fan of lifting weights and all that love it okay what else do we have turkey is not going to sell drones to india all right no problem we'll make our own drones we don't need turkish drones how long is russia going to continue the ukraine war so the question is what is russia's objective russia's objective now by now it's been so many months it started in february right now i think it's becoming clear that russia's objective was to neutralize the threat of ukraine see ukraine had the largest army in continental europe an army that is bigger than germany and france put together massive army and they had all this aid coming in from nato so that was a, a almost an existential threat for the russians so russia's actual objective seems to have been to completely neutralize this threat to neutralize the U- ukrainian army and to ensure that it is never a threat to russia again it was not really to capture the whole of ukraine and all that which they have not shown any inclination to do so they have captured the regions that are of interest to them the donbas region the crimea region and slowly they will take over the the black sea uh, region as well but the real objective is to ensure that ukraine is never a threat again for them and they are succeeding very well at that and they have already captured more than a quarter of the entire nation of ukraine which is a, which is a huge nation isn't it so that and i think this this entire uh, campaign is going to continue for the foreseeable future russia is in no hurry it is classic slow war step by step and they are they are doing well they have not even used the air force which they are keeping in reserve in case it is needed for some other reason so yeah that is the situation and that's what we can surmise from how things have gone in the past you know many months okay my friends we are at the end of today's session thank you very much all of you for making this a wonderful session great questions and let's keep doing this and maybe something new next week perhaps let's see all right all right thank you very much everybody have a good night good day wherever you are take care and i will see you in the next live stream until then bye bye